from the Clark Ford Studio in Oxford, Mississippi, MBW Digital proudly presents the Oxford Exxon Podcast. I'd say thanks for tuning in, but why am I going to give you a round of applause for something you're supposed to do, to be frank? And now, here are your hosts, Chase Parm. And broadcast school has really paid off. And Neil McCrady. I deserve to be on TV. Thursday edition of the Oxford Exxon podcast. Chase Parham, Neil McCready, Clark Ford Studio. Aaron Dickens, who covers Texas Tech for Rivals.com, will join us here in a little bit. Give a uh, final preview of the Red Raiders before everybody heads to Houston for the 11 a.m. season opener on Saturday, Ole Miss and Texas Tech. So we'll have plenty from him and uh, and more and just a little bit of a scheduling update. We'll again be at Funky's on the Oxford Square tonight. 5.30 start for that, as always. Jeffrey Wright headed down to hang out with us. So come and uh, heckle Jeffrey tonight if you so desire. Got, uh, got drinking food specials, as always. They're doing all their large cheese bread stuff for $10, $2 domestics, $4 margaritas, and uh, and more. Also, they are uh, open at 10 a.m. Saturday for a watch party. So if you'd like to come, have a couple drinks, and uh, watch the Rebels on Saturday, they are a place for that. So we'll get into uh, that and plenty more today on the show. The podcast brought to you every single day by the Oxford Exxon Highway 6 West in oxford get the speed pass plus out pay right there at the pump and save money doing so it is easy it's efficient don't have to worry about identity theft or credit card skimmers as well and remember as labor day is coming up sunday and monday a two-day special at the oxford exxon two slabs of ribs for 25 dollars three slabs of ribs for 33 dollars so take advantage of those specials they have wet and dry neil have done it many neil and i have done it many many times so uh oxford exxon highway six west for that and again coming to you from the clark ford studio we are Clark Ford and Amory, Mississippi, 662-257-1900 is the number. Call the number, ask for Corey Clark, tell Corey what new Ford you're looking for. He'll send you a quote within 15 minutes in business hours. It's that simple. It's right to the bottom line. There's no haggling. You uh, call, you tell him what you want. He's going to send you a quote. You get the quote, and then you can do the rest. It's up to you. You can shop it around, or you can go ahead and let Corey and the people at Clark Ford do for you what they've done for so many others, and that's take the hassle out of the everyday car buying experience. Um, you get great service after the sale. Uh, the, the service on your vehicle is incredible. Corey wants to be your car guy. He wants to be your truck guy. He'll go the extra mile for you. Uh, and we will, too. Tell Corey that you heard about Clark Ford on any of our podcasts. You can mention this one, Soft Verbal, Greatest Pod in the South, Beer Garden, all of those uh, either up or coming to you in the next 24 hours or so. And uh, you'll get $500 off the bottom line from Clark Ford and Amory. Again, 662-257-1900. Good bit of content up at com in the last 24 hours. Um, Matt Luke, Miles Hartsfield, and Jordan Tamu, the people that uh, the media heard from last night. That is up on the site as well as uh, the week three preview for high school recruiting, the following the future from that week. Got a soft verbal up as well. Matt Clare who covers uh, recruiting for Texas Tech on the show with uh, Russell and Neil, the soft verbal from, presented by Billy's Pecans is up. And then uh, this morning I had a, a content item looking at three different things. We do some buyer sales for the 2018 season. We ranked the last 10 season openers for Ole Miss. As most of them were fairly indicative of what was to come later in the season and gave a pretty good glimpse after one game. And then I've got some thoughts on Chad Kelly as well. So that in uh, in that content item, all that at rebelgrove.com. This morning, picks will go up on Friday. We are now doing picks on Friday instead of Thursday. So a little bit of a, a schedule change there. But it won't, uh, won't hinder you too much. Plenty of time to copy us and get those bets in with the bookies and the casinos They're prior up. to uh, action on Saturday. So it's completely in the system. I'll just punch the is. button at well, my flight five a.m. or whatever. I'll yeah, punch the button at about four a.m. and it's ready to go. It's ready to go. Take off, if you will. Yep. A couple editing things I do need to change, but yeah, for the most part, we're 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 good. Okay. We're uh, we're in good shape. So I found one and fixed it. Yeah. Well, we need to change the Georgia photo. It's too small. Like it didn't format right because it wasn't uh, big enough. A couple things like that. Uh, nothing, nothing big. I have an OCD mind when it comes to that, and I noticed it. Uh, anyway, all right, plenty, uh, plenty up at rebelgrove.com. Right, we'll, we'll start. Did you see, did you see where uh, Donald Trump's criticism of Jeff Sessions? Did you see this? It had to do with Alabama, right? Yeah, I just saw this. This is fascinating because Donald Trump wins Alabama. 
But he, he's, he's treading on some dangerous ground inside the state of Alabama when he makes fun of their accent. Oh, is that what he did? He okay, what do we have? Jeff Sessions, Jeff Sessions sort of talks like this. He does. He uh, says, well, I'll tell you, Mr. Cooper, uh, what we must do is very important here in Alabama to honor Alabama. He talks it's like a movie fake. character. It's fake. He talks like a movie character. It's and, and, and a lot of people in that part of Alabama, especially the people who sort of put on some L's, they talk in a way that is, uh, well, it's on, it's not really the way that they talk. It's very, very uh, orchestrated and engineered accent of such to indicate a uh, certain standing. And Donald Trump criticizing that is not going to go over well in a way that I'm telling you is going to be fast. Okay, look, I, I understand what you're saying, and, and, and you're right to some extent. Alabama is not voting Democrat. No, 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 but I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you, he is going, this will cost, not going to cost him a state, but this is, I mean, he's going, he goes to places like Alabama to have these rallies in front of 70,000 people. You can't disrespect the tide like that, can you? 70,000 people won't show up if he's making fun of the way that they talk. Because it's a very sensitive topic, though. Don't think they overlook it because of their jobs and their income and different things if they agree with those policies. I overlook it at some point, Chase, but when you get into something, you, you're accusing them of talking like they have marbles in their mouths. And it's not going to go over well. I'm telling you it's not. And then he said that a his degree from the University of Alabama Law School is questionable. Compared to the Ivy League institutions that most of his cohort cohorts have uh, yeah. degrees from. Where's Trump's degree from? Where do you go to school? Seriously. Do you know? I don't even know. I don't know that I do either. I For some reason, Yale always stuck out, but I have no clue why I think that. Like, none whatsoever. Nothing. Like, I, I honestly don't know where he went to college. That's probably sad on our part, to be honest. Everybody's probably screaming at us right now, but I... Well, they probably are. I, I just don't. Um, I don't keep up as well as I used to. Let's see if I can find Fordham it. and uh, Penn. He went to the Wharton School. I actually knew that. I, I'm, I'm okay. an idiot. I actually did know I that. I did not. Yeah, he went to the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. After starting out at Fordham. That's right. So. Fordham is not in the Ivy League. Is that correct? Fordham is not. They are, uh, I believe they're the Rams when they play college football. I believe they're an FCS institution, if I have that correctly. Okay. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll start here. So we got picks on uh, in the system. I don't want to give away picks, but as you started writing it, did opinions on games change? Did you kind of catch yourself going as you get closer that maybe some of your, your early and preconceived notions were not what you uh, thought as game week gets here? Because I had a couple. I actually changed a couple picks than what I was expecting to. Um, I don't know. I've got one that is really different from everybody else. Do you? That's kind of built around things that people uh, yeah, trust that. have told yeah, yeah. me. Um. And the one I went back and forth on is Ole Miss and Texas Tech. And I sided on the side of being consistent. I don't know why being consistent matters. But you talk about being OCD. I'm a little OCD about that. I mean, you're allowed to change your mind. That's not. Yeah, I know. And I almost did. I, I go back and forth on that game a lot. I'm, and from reading the commentary. My confidence level on one side or the other on that game was incredibly high until about 10 days ago. And it has just plummeted since then. I'm literally 50-50 on it. You could, you could come down and tell me anything is going to happen, and I would say, okay. Audio issues. I hate the soundboard with a passion. It doesn't. We could have taken it down. We could have. It does not hold up well. And no. I end up having to change the gain and the different things constantly during the show. I've got to do two shows later today. That's the reason it was still sitting. Uh, yeah, it can be fixed, but it's it's not very good. Anyway, yeah, Ole Miss and Texas Tech is the – there are two games of interest to me this weekend, and Ole Miss and Texas Tech is one of them, and the other one is Miami and LSU. Those are the two that, that I go, wow, this thing could go in any number of directions. The third one on that is Auburn and Washington, and 
I, I just think I know what's going to happen. Um, I'm interested by it, but I, I still think I know what's going to happen. Um, and then you got Alabama and Louisville, where I love Louisville's offensive line trash talking Alabama's defensive line. That typically goes well with uh, with things. You see that? Yes, it's dumb. I don't know what now, okay. doing. No, I, I can't. I, I can't talk out both sides of my mouth here, though. I don't think trash talk matters. I don't. I, I don't think it has any impact on the game whatsoever. But I do have a false sense. I, I do think a false sense of confidence or a lack of understanding what you're going against is a very accurate and real thing. I'm a major, major disliker. Of trash talk, but that doesn't mean it actually has impact on games. No, no, no. I, just as a rule, I, I, I hate it so much that I can't get past it. And so I catch myself now hoping Alabama beats Louisville by seventy points. Just destroy them. Well, there's a decent chance that happens. I just don't understand why any opponent would ever go into a game talking trash. I, I don't under what. What is the what can possibly be gained by it? Trying to motivate your own teammates? I talked to someone inside the Alabama program who told me that a couple of years ago when Dak Prescott made a big deal about how he didn't play the year before against Alabama, that that absolutely served as motivation for Alabama that week. And that going into that week, even though Mississippi State was number one in the country, before Prescott's comments, Alabama was having a hard time getting that team motivated. They were tired. They've played in so many. And in fairness to Alabama, they've played in so many Super Bowls. They get get everybody's big shot. and it's That after a while, you forget from their perspective, it's just another damn game. And that Monday, they were just kind of flat. That Tuesday, they were kind of flat. And then those comments came out. and Defensively, they were like, oh, okay, well, needed something. There's the fuel. Why you choose to provide that fuel, whether or not it serves a purpose, is beyond me. It's Louisville senior offensive lineman Lucas McNeil. Um, maybe I'm mispronouncing. I don't know. Uh, the direct quote, so if we can dominate up front, then we're not worried about the defensive front at all. I definitely think we're capable of going out, starting off fast, and dominating their defensive line. Quote from Mr. McNeil there. I mean, keep that in house. Say that in house. To your say it during practice to your buddies after the thing. I mean, say it in house. Say it in your meetings. Hey guys, I think we can dominate this game. But in the media, why you would say that is beyond. And listen, I, as a, I can hear fellow media members going, Neil, stop. We want this stuff. I get it. If you say that to me, I'm running with it. I mean, I'm running to the presses as fast as possible, but I don't get it. I don't understand it, but I'm a, I'm a very anti trash talk person. I'm the guy that when the Cardinal fan out of the blue trash talks me, I just block him. I don't, I just don't like it. I don't like trash talk in general. I just, it it doesn't have, I don't, I don't like it at all. I stumbled across this yesterday as I was uh, looking at, prior season openers for Ole Miss the last 10 years or so, which ended right with the, the nut 2008 or nine was the first one, obviously, whatever. Um, Ed Orgeron in his three year tenure at Ole Miss, his teams never scored more than 28 points against an FBS opponent, not even power five FBS. Yeah. They beat Memphis 28 to 25 one year in, in an opener. And that was the only time they scored twenty eight points. Ole Miss, as a is a program against against FBS teams, had a drought of scoring thirty points from October two thousand four until the opener in two thousand eight. S- beat South Carolina thirty one twenty eight on that Bill Flowers catch in the end zone in two thousand four in Columbia. I remember that. And didn't do it again until Nutt beat Memphis 45-17 or 41-17 or 41-24 or whatever it was in their opener in 08. That's unreal. Yeah. Not 30 points. I, and I, honestly, I didn't look at this. I'm not sure he scored 30 points against anyone other than Northwestern State in his second to last game. And he beat Northwestern State 38-31 when Northwestern State had a ball in the end zone on the final play. The tie the game that uh Sealed his fate. In a game that sealed his fate because there was no one there. Yeah, the crowd was 
fifteen thousand. I mean, nothing. Not to go down that path again. But when the people act like that, fourth down decision was the. Yeah, no, it wasn't. I can tell you emphatically, it was not. It was a convenient excuse, but the yeah. decision was made. I did that ranking on ten openers and how they, what they meant to the season as far as foreshadowing or anything. What would you have had at number one? Let me go through and think about them. Uh, you may give them to you. The one that positively. There, there are two that I couldn't decide between one positive, one negative. The positive one, looking back, would be the win at, uh, against Boise in Atlanta. That was my number one. That was number one for me. The negative, looking back, it's hard to do this because you have you you do have the benefit of twenty twenty, and it's hard to take that away. Um, well, I mean, I, I kind of gave twenty twenty. I'll give you my countdown. We'll run through them real quick. This is not terrible. Okay. The one I was going to say is the, the loss to BYU at home. Okay. See, I had that one way down the list, and I'll explain why. Okay. So, okay, number ten, two thousand nine, Ole Miss forty five fourteen over Memphis. That was a good team that beat a, beat Memphis. Who oh, cares? Wait, wait, Did I nothing. do remember the number one? The number one as in terms of a negative would be Jacksonville State. That's number two. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. So Ole Miss forty five, Memphis fourteen and oh nine. Whatever meant nothing to anybody. They won a game against a bad team. They were top five in the country. Who yeah. cares? I've got number nine, that BYU Ole Miss game, 14-13. I'll tell you why. Okay. Because 2010's already happened. We already know the program has gone down the tank. They already suck, and Masoli's gone. So, to me, them losing that opener, if you went into that season and went, hey, they're about to turn this thing back around, that was kind of false hoping on you. So I don't think that it changed perspective much losing that game fourteen to thirteen. Now somehow that BYU team did go nine and three, even though Texas beat. I mean not Texas, uh, Utah beat them like fifty two to ten or something a couple weeks later. But well, I think if they win that game, they might get bowl. No, well, no, no that's eleven. But I'm sorry, if they win that game, maybe they don't completely go down the tubes as fast as they did because they play Vanderbilt better in two weeks. Maybe. Because they beat an FCS team the next week, and then Vanderbilt's the yeah. next week. I mean, just maybe. I mean, again, we'll never know. But I don't think the plan at that that day, going into that day, I don't think the plan was to fire Houston Nutt in the middle of the season. Right. Well, no, I agree with that. And I don't think the plan was for Pete Boone to step down. Uh, number eight, I had Ole Miss in South Alabama last year just because I got to play football again. Number seven, 2012, Hugh Freeze, Ole Miss 49, Central Arkansas 27. In the game, Central Arkansas was winning at the half. If you remember back to halftime, you kind of thought, wow, there's really a road here to uh, – that, that, that has to be taken for Ole Miss. Yeah. Uh, 2013, Ole Miss 39, Vanderbilt 35. That Jeff Scott scamper late to win a game. It's a hell of a game. Frankly, between two really good teams, that Vanderbilt team won nine games that year. Yeah. That was a James Franklin team. So, big win to kind of put them in another uh, in, in another light because that team, that team, if you lose that one, it gets a little funny in the middle of the year and you're, uh, you're kind of right where you were in 2012. Actually had number five in 2015, even though they beat UT Martin 76-3. to It was the debut of Chad Kelly. It showed you that that offense was going to be different than had it been Devontae Kincaid or Ryan Buchanan going into that opener. So I thought even in a blowout, that was a telling opener just because Kelly and some of the talent they had on that offensive side of the ball. Um, number four, 2008, Ole Miss 41, Memphis 24, because, frankly, they hadn't beaten anybody at all. That team had to just win a game and, yeah. and do it handedly was nice against, you know, no matter what they did. And then uh, number three to close it out, because we have Jacksonville State number two and then Boise State number one, is uh, the Florida State comeback in 2016. Is that foreshadowed two weeks later when Ole Miss blew a, a three-touchdown lead against Alabama yeah. that they had in the first half. So, anyway. That was a crazy game. Yeah, Ole Miss is up. I've got it here. Ole Miss is up 28-13 at halftime. I think they were up 28 to either three or six at one point. It was six. And then Florida State scored 23 straight in the third quarter to take the lead. Yeah, that was foreshadowing for sure. Yeah. So, I've got that number three, Jacksonville State number two, because that's just coming off the Cotton Bowl. You don't realize just how far that program falls in eight months. And, somebody who did. Well, that's true. Thought Masoli might save it <laughs> enough, but um, I somebody who said, "Boy, I tell you what, this is not good." Yeah, you know, fourth downs do a lot of bad for Ole Miss. They, uh, oh, Jacksonville State outscored Ole Miss twenty-one to three in the fourth quarter of that game, and completed a fourth and fifteen pass in overtime to score, and then went forward and had the little shovel pass in the end zone for the two-point conversion to to win the game. 
I'll give myself credit for this because I miss a lot of football picks. I'm bad at it. I don't. I, I'm not. It's just not my strong sport. When the news came down that Jeremiah Masoli was ineligible before they won the appeal, remember this? Oh yeah, I stalked him for a week. I remember walking off a practice field and I said to you, one and eleven is not out of the out of the question. One and eleven is not out of the question. Because that was Nathan Stanley and stuff playing quarterback, and I told you, no way. It was probably if without Masoli, it was probably Tulane and nothing else. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look at the schedule, but I can remember thinking there's not a free W on the schedule without Masoli. Pretty sure it was Tulane. They played the next week and won yeah, in the Superdome. That feels right. Yeah. Pretty sure that was right. So, and then yeah, Boise at number one, just because that's that number one scoring offense. I mean, defense. They shut down Jay Ajayi. They won a big time game on a neutral side against a good program. It and like it was one hell of a football team that day. Yeah, it kind of they started slow, and then once that point, they popped them. And oh, and when they popped them, they popped them. Yeah, there were hits in that game that those kids at Boise. Were. It looked like a different Ole Miss team that day compared to anything we, the, the kids had grown up it was at that the point. most physical Ole Miss team I had seen in a long time. Since 08. Yeah. Since that defense late in 2008. More explosive than 08. Yeah. Because there was more team speed. That team was just so good up front with Hardy and Jerry and, and those again, guys. I go right back to my thing. If I, if we ever get a chance to talk to Hugh Freeze, I know everybody wants to talk about escorts and, 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 massages and stuff and frankly if you're going to have the conversation you have to be able to talk about those things otherwise I'm not doing the interview but the one thing I really want to get to is what changed philosophically and why because it was working yeah so anyway that's uh that's a preview so I hope might talk about Chad in a second the other uh point of that story but again it's up at rebelgrove.com you can see all the text for yourself and we'll go to Aaron Dickens in a second for did I take the podcast is brought to you in part by Oxford Wine and Spirits becoming Oxford's most popular place to buy wine and spirits located close to campus on College Hill Road next to Lost Pizza Neil and I shop there regularly and everyday low prices are 5% lower than industry standards, and also they'll make it even lower for you. Go in, stock up for the weekend, tell them you heard about it on the podcast, 5% off wine, 10% off liquor, if you spend $150 or more with Oxford Wine and Spirits, again, next to Lost Pizza on College Hill Road. How well do you know your credit? Brian McLaurin is an experienced attorney offering a unique, highly personalized service to not only repair credit, but also educate clients on the ever-changing world of credit. He will work with you for an entire year to help you create a personalized plan to raise your credit score to help you meet your financial goals. No one else offers this kind of personalized credit counseling. It's why Gambrell and Associates refer their clients to Brian to get a fresh start. So whether you're looking to fight off debt collectors, get approved for home car loans, or for that luxury credit card, let Brian McLaurin get your credit fixed and teach you how to take control of your credit. He provides you the valuable information he's acquired through years of experience and research it allows Brian to offer a unique personalized service for anyone in any state as he is always available to his clients by phone and email and he's ready to work for you. Contact Brian at BHM I'm sorry, BH McLaren Law dot com at gmail dot com or call him at six six two two nine eight two zero two nine. Youth basketball registration and the Oxford Park Commission's right around the corner. It starts on Tuesday, so sign up your son or daughter. For one of OPC's Hoops Leagues, age range is 5 to 15. The cost is $50 per kid. Last year, they had more than 600 young people take part in the leagues, and the numbers are expected to be similar this year, so don't miss your opportunity when it comes time to sign up for OPC Youth Basketball. It's OxfordParkCommission.com. We're also brought to you by Grenada Nissan. Grenada Nissan located just off Interstate 55 in Grenada, Mississippi. They have a complete selection of new and previously owned Nissan vehicles. Great uh, lease deals as well. Go in, uh, ask to test drive one. Uh, you'll love it. The service after the sales, outstanding. Gene and Sandy are wonderful people. You'll have a great experience at Grenada Nissan. It's GrenadaNissanUSA.com. Pocket Sales are brought to you by Tyson Drugs. TysonDrugs.com. Look at downtown Holly Springs and their phone number 662-252-2321. They have a great app. 
Give them a call. Let them take care of your pharmaceutical needs. They deliver wherever you are. And they're also now in Oxford as well with GNM Pharmacy on South Lamar, and they deliver local in the Oxford area. Now, Aaron Dickens, who covers Texas Tech for Rivals.com, on the Billy's Pecans Hotline. Aaron, good morning. Ole Miss and Texas Tech, a couple days away now. I see that uh, Mr. Kingsbury still being fairly coy about the quarterback competition over in Lubbock. However, it looks like every single person uh, believes McLean Carter is going to get pretty much every snap this weekend. Yeah, I don't think it's um, <clears throat> much of a secret. This is not really um, – this is kind of SOP for Kingsbury. <laughs> even, uh, even in 2015 – when Patrick Mahomes was going into his first season as a starter and the worst kept secret in town that he would be the starter and had beat out Davis Webb uh, pretty handedly. E- even in that season, he kept it pretty, Hey, well, you'll find out on Saturday, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think part of that is um, perhaps out of respect for the other players that are, that are competing. Perhaps it's gamesmanship. Perhaps it's um, some sort of, uh, you know, exercise to prolong this as long as possible to maybe discourage transfers. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's some combination of the three, but th- this is not really all that surprising, at least around here. You know, uh, when everybody talks about McLean Carter, nobody really, you know, gives great credits to his physical tools. I think he can be very effective in that offense. What What, what is it? Is it? Is it system? Is it Kingsbury's tutelage? What's allowed Tech to kind of just insert pretty much anybody and get a lot of success out of it? And obviously have a lot of NFL quarterbacks too. I, I'm, I'm not disparaging the talent whatsoever, but it does seem like there's never much of a misstep when it comes to quarterback at Texas Tech. I mean, at some point, that's going to fall off. And, it, and it, f- folks around here are – offense snobs, right? They, they, over the last I mean, 18 seasons, have become accustomed to a certain level of offense performance. And when they don't get that, um, you know, they recognize that and they, they call it out. Last year, Nick Shimanek, his numbers, I think for, I don't know, 85% of the country would have been viewed as excellent, perhaps one of the best passing seasons in history. But around here, it just wasn't good enough. Um, but at some point, that's going to fall off, right? You're not entitled to uh, above average to great quarterback play every season. Maybe this is the year. I don't know. But I think around here, there's a benefit of the doubt given to both Cliff Kingsbury, given his track record, not only at Texas Tech, but at A&M and at Houston, uh, but also this program. This is just kind of what Tech does. They churn out quarterbacks that put up big numbers. Like you said, probably a, a good chunk of that is the system uh, on average, but you also have exceptional talents from time to time. And then, you know, they get receivers that put up big numbers. Uh, and so I think at least around here, the expectation is the names might have changed. Uh, and, and certainly I don't think they expect Pat Mahomes or Graham Harrell or Cliff Kingsbury type numbers, uh, but they certainly expect uh, above average at the very least. Are you still expecting a pretty steady diet at least early on of the uh, the run game given what Ole Miss does and then the fact that, that Tech is pretty experienced up front and in the backfield? Well, I do, and plus the, the the offensive personnel, at least in terms of their experience and uh, where, where they're inexperienced, leans pretty heavily toward the run. Uh, they bring in Kevin Johns over the off season, ran offenses at Indiana, uh, coached at Northwestern under uh, Pat Fitzgerald, ran the offense at at a Mac school last off season, and I think that was a, a very clear emphasis: uh, more physical up front. Uh, get more production, get more reliability out of the run game. I mean, I I think people – this kind of got overlooked last year with the team's kind of dumpster fire situation at uh, at place kicker and the kind of up-and-down performance of the quarterback. But they ran the ball like 46% of the time last year. This was not some sort of stereotypical air raid, um, you know, five wide, chunk it. 80% 80% of the time. I mean, Kingsbury wants to run the football. People don't believe that, but they led the SEC in rushing when he was at a and uh, They ran the ball at a pretty good clip at Houston uh, with Case Keenum. They did that uh, here in 2015 when they had DeAndre Washington now with the Raiders. Uh, so I think that he wants to run the ball. It's just been a situation where do, do you have the personnel for it? Um, you know, are, are you giving yourself the best chance to win if you take the ball out of Pat Mahomes' hands uh, the last few years? So, um, especially with the Johns edition, I think absolutely uh, they will um, uh, stick to it, be committed to it. It's all they talked about all offseason. 
Uh, I, I don't know that they're going to run the ball 50 plus percent of the time on on, on the season, but uh, it, it wouldn't surprise me if they ran uh, 35, 40 times on Saturday. Tell me if this is fair. Kingsbury gets a lot of criticism. A lot of it is deserved. Yet this is a guy that if you talk to people in the business, they'll tell you that he's one of the best play callers and he's also one of the best in-game adjustment guys, not just halftime where he gets a chance to, to have 15 minutes to talk to people and then make adjustments, but on the fly making adjustments. Would you agree that, I mean, from a, just an offensive coordinator versus defensive coordinator standpoint that tactically he's one of the best? I think certainly from a game plan standpoint, uh, from a, just a general offensive mind standpoint, I would not disagree with you there at all. Clearly, I'm not uh, down there at halftime. We're not privy to what they discuss and what kind of uh, um, you, you know changes that they make. I will say that he does get a lot of criticism. A lot of that is because of the record. It's not quite as personal with him as I've seen here with Tommy Tuberville, certainly, and even with Mike Leach, Cliff Kingsbury is, um, I mean, beloved might be a bit too strong of a word, but fans here feel a bit differently about him, I think, than they would if this was some sort of guy from, you know, the, uh, Neil Brown or Seth Luttrell or, you know, name kind of the, the rising assistant because he played here. He, he, for all the, the people on our message board, for example, that are the harshest critics of him during the season, uh, even during the off season, whenever they get some sort of um, behind the scenes footage or some sort of in depth interview, they all gush about the guy. It's just that he hasn't won enough. In terms of the adjustments, his record after halftime is not very good. I don't have it right here in front of me, uh, but I think he's won maybe just three games in five seasons maybe four when trying at halftime. Uh, it, it's a, a an overwhelming and staggering number. I can uh, send it to you after this, but um, it, it's not been very, very good. It's something that fans have kind of caught on. And so, you know, odds are, at least over the first five seasons, that's a pretty substantial sample size. If, if Tech is down at the half, it slides out. Let's take a break in our talk with Aaron. And take the podcast also brought to you by Community Mortgage, Oxford, Memphis, Soto County, and Chattanooga underwriting a processing done in Memphis. You're getting local underwriting. You understand your market. A leader in condo financing and the float down option which allows you to lock in the current rate. But if rates go down before you close, you get that lower rate. 662-234-2704 or JLO, J-L-O-W-E at communitymtg.com. Podcast also brought to you by Harry Alexander. Harry is an Oxford-based REMAX legacy realty agent. He's been in Oxford more than four decades. No one knows the residential and condo market better in Oxford than Harry Alexander. Go to his sites, harryalexander.com, click on the Properties and Neighborhoods tab, filter through by what you are looking for, know that the results that you see are updated daily, and then send him an email. He'll take care of the rest. It's ha at harryalexander.com. Rebel Nation 2018 is the year of the fan. Ole Miss Athletics wants to showcase your stories and recognize you, the Ole Miss fan base. Exciting prizes and experiences throughout the year will be featured on omyearofthefan.com and updated often. So be sure to visit omyearofthefan.com. Now back to Aaron Dickens on the Billy's Pecans Hotline. What's kind of your take on Tech's defense? They've got a lot of guys back. I think Longo told us of the day 10 starters returning and at least started a game. 29 turnovers last year. There's a lot of experience. They were okay at times, but then part of me goes, I'm a Saints fan. I get it after 2009. Turnovers are kind of hard to expect and duplicate year over year. No, I, I agree with you, and I, I heard y'all discussing this on uh, yesterday's podcast. Um, and, and you're right; there is an element of luck to it, right? At some, I mean, at some point, no matter what you you coach these guys to do, no matter what scheme you run, sometimes the other team just puts the ball on the turf. And certainly, that happened uh, happened a couple of times last season, at least once again in the, uh, the Houston game. Uh, but if you look at David Gibbs' track record at Texas Tech and elsewhere, I mean, four out of the last five years. They had 25 or more forced turnovers, 29 last year, 25 at Texas Tech in 2015, 30 at Houston in 2014, and 43 in 2013. So I, I think that there's a bit of a track record there with Gibbs and what he does that you, you can maybe count on it to some degree. I don't think that they're going to get 29 turnovers this year, but I don't think they're going to fall off the map either. It's just kind of what they do. Uh, to the defense overall, if you look at a lot of their numbers, statistically, they were 
were not a good defense last year, right, in the mm-hmm. vacuum. Like 100 and something against the uh, scoring defense and yards given up. I mean, pretty much picked the category outside of turnovers. And in a vacuum, that's not a very good defense. It's really more a bad defense. I think you take into account the, the conference that they play in, the Big 12, the quarterbacks they went up against last year, Baker Mayfield, Mason Rudolph, Will Greer, Kenny Hill, et cetera. Uh, and then also the improvement that they made from 2017, sorry, 2016 to 2017. That's why I think folks around here are feeling so positive about things on that side of the ball. Um, but they, they have uh, – it's a big jump from where they were last year from a number standpoint to being a, like, good defense overall this year. Although if they get 29 turnovers, I don't think that it really matters uh, as much. Uh, this year yeah a lot of times turnovers you know we talk about putting on the turf maybe if anything you're a better turnover team than you're getting credit for because you don't get those cheap ones you know if you earn them that's kind of different and that's probably a little less uh fluctuating than other things but i asked neil this yesterday you probably heard it uh so you know where i'm going for tech what does a win look like what does a loss look like what are kind of the couple things that are going to determine this thing for you well i think a win looks like i don't I certainly don't expect, and I think even in a, you know, a most positive possible scenario for Texas Tech, you're not going to like contain that Ole Miss offense, right? It, I, I find that very, very hard to believe. Um, to me, a win looks like Tech's ground game is as effective as it hopes it is against Ole Miss. Uh, you can kind of dictate the pace of the game to some degree and force just enough mistakes uh, with that Ole Miss offense to, to win. M- maybe you put some distance, again, a most positive scenario toward the end of the game, uh, but I-, I sure don't expect Tech to lock anybody down in terms of you know, single-digit points or even below 20. Uh, a-, a loss looks like you know, the Ole Miss offense is as, is as good as advertised. Your defense um, isn't up to the challenge. And that tech offense, which has a, a good amount of questions and a fair amount of kind of prove it with the run game, just doesn't get on track. Just because we haven't asked, I'm just kind of curious. It's, it's not uh, it's not interesting, but I'm still kind of curious. What special teams like at Tech if this thing gets close late? <laughs> well, last year was a disaster. Okay. I mean, last year they missed 11 kicks. Their their starting place kicker Clayton Hatfield uh, tweaked. Some, had some sort of hip injury in the uh, in the preseason and uh, wasn't right at any point in the, in the regular season. He didn't play for a good chunk of it, and it was a, a complete and total disaster. You know, they were up, I think, 35-17 third quarter against West Virginia. They missed some makeable kicks, ended up losing that game. They're up by seven late at home against Kansas State. I think about maybe three minutes to go. A 25-ish yard field goal to make it a 10-point margin and pretty much ice that game. They miss it. K-State ties it. Tech loses in overtime. Um, it, it, it was it was a disaster. I think it affected uh, uh, the, the team mentally. So it, it's been a hot topic of conversation around here all the offseason. Clayton Hatfield, who was preseason all Big 12 going into last year, so he's not some like scrub. Uh, is fully healthy, full go, and I think the expectation around the program is that last year was a blip, and um, you know he'll be back to form this season. So who, who knows? But last year, yeah, it was it, it was why they were six and seven and not seven and five, or or maybe even eight and four. I'm looking at the schedule for Tech, and we, we, we've we kind of looked all off season about what's kind of the swing portions for every SEC team. But as I look at this thing, other than Lamar, every game going into that bye week in the first week of October, I mean, that bye week could be jubilation, and it could be catastrophe for Cliff Kingsbury because you've got Ole Miss, Houston, at Oklahoma State and West Virginia. And then when you come out of the bye week, you've got TCU too. So, I mean, talk about – I mean, this thing could go any number of directions in the first five, six weeks. It really could, like from a, a tech standpoint, and, and maybe that's it's viewed differently outside the, the tech bubble, right, as it probably is with most uh, fan bases. But you look at that tech schedule, I don't see a lot of guaranteed wins, right? I mean, Lamar, clearly, you would sure think Kansas. They haven't won a road game uh, since 2009. Um, wow, really? But outside of that, yeah. No, okay. they, their last road win was 2009 against Colorado. Okay, sorry. So, yeah, um, 
and you, you don't want to be that program to, to break that streak, let me tell you. Uh, but outside of Lamar and probably Kansas, find the guaranteed wins, right? I mean, Baylor was 1-11 last year, and I'm not going to chalk that game up as a sure win. I mean, but at the same time, I don't know how many games on there are for sure Lock City losses. Probably maybe Oklahoma, November 3rd. But Oklahoma State lost a lot last year. They're breaking in a new quarterback. Sure, it's in Stillwater, but you get them early. Maybe some kinks or something worked out. West Virginia at home, you had them on the ropes last year. They have some depth issues on defense. I, I could be convinced either way. West Virginia, I think even, uh, not sure how much stock you put in the early lines, but one that I saw, I think in July, had Tech a slight favorite in that game. So not a lot of definite losses, but definitely not um, many sure wins. So I think every game is a swing game, especially this Ole Miss game, because you look at it, say, say you lose that game. Tech is only a two-point favorite. Wouldn't stun you at all if Tech loses this game. Uh you beat Lamar the next week, you're one and one. All of a sudden that Houston game is incredibly important, right? Incredibly important because you're staring down the barrel of maybe one and two with a trip to Stillwater, haven't won there since 2001. Wow. Uh, so it, it's uh, it's a very interesting schedule because you, there's really not a lot you can count on. We're doing our picks. Uh, it won't be published till Friday for anybody Ole Miss fans listening, obviously. But um, Tennessee plays West Virginia. Are you buying Will Greer as this quarterback savior no. of the Big 12? No. I mean, okay. he's clearly the, the best returning quarterback in the league, right? There's no doubt about that. He, he is. I have no issue with him being preseason all Big 12 quarterback. Uh, you know, any of those accolades, he, he is by and far head and shoulders the best guy returning because who else is going to be right it's not going to be charlie brewer at baylor kyler murray hasn't started a game at oklahoma yet who knows how that will go uh i mean taylor cornelius at oklahoma state who mclean carter same thing case has a couple of quarterbacks but no clear-cut uh starter yet between alex delton and skylar thompson texas relatively unsettled although sam ellinger uh will get the start so it's really Will Greer by default, but is, is he Pat Mahomes? Is he Baker Mayfield? Is he Sam Bradford or Colt McCoy or any of these kind of transcendent uh, Big 12 passes that we've seen over the last decade? No, not even close. Hey, on another subject, Saturday morning is going to roll around, and ESPN, who's a corporate partner with several of the leagues and that, that play college football, they're going to – pop open the, the college game day show and they're going to do all the pageantry and all that stuff. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be a, a sour puss here. Or the guy that's the sort of the, uh, the guy that that's the party pooper, I guess, but how much do you think that show and college football broadcast in general are going to delve into the deal at Ohio state, the deal at Maryland, an off season that, quite frankly, has been a remarkably bad look for the sport. It's a great question. Uh, I mean, Herb Street's been fairly critical, I think, uh, of both the situation at Ohio State and also elsewhere in the Big Ten. Around the country, Rutgers has an issue. Wisconsin has an issue. Uh, it's, I mean, really a lot of it seems kind of uh, localized in the Big Ten. But I think they'll touch on it. I don't know that they'll be as, as kind of beholden to – um, you know, trying to please their college football masters as they do with the NFL, perhaps. I think they're probably more open uh, to to lobby some criticism that way than they would if this was in the NFL. Yeah, I hope so. I hope I hope that there's a, an objective approach to it. I mean, there are games to be talked about, and there are games to be enjoyed and 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 analyzed, and all of those things, but. But it is certainly in the undercurrent on Saturday, and I hope people acknowledge that. I, I, I don't – like Ohio State, some of the, the public records requests, they had to be fulfilled yesterday. There, there's a lot of shady stuff in, in this in the story with Urban Meyer and with Zach Smith. and I mean, Zach Smith, very active on Twitter yesterday. It was a, stunningly – you have to wonder what, what in the hell his oh, attorney – meltdown, yeah. Yeah, his attorney who, who's had a public meltdown of his own, it, it's just a – Kind of a shocking look, really. It, it it lets you. I thought it did sort of give us an, an a, a look inside this guy's persona a little bit, and you sort of see how 
how some of the things that are alleged to have happened very well could have happened. Right, yeah, good job convincing us you're not a domestic abuser by being a total lunatic on Twitter <laughs> for the last six hours. Good job, guy. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Um, all right, last thing. Appreciate the time, Aaron. I guess, uh, yeah, well, I guess we'll throw this at you. What are you? What, what, what's going to happen? You got a prediction you can put up on the side or what? And then what's kind of the, the thing that's going to turn it one way or the other? Yeah, I mean, I, I've kind of been back and forth on this all off season. Um, you know, the, the Tech is a slight favorite. Um, I, I think what it comes down to to me is I feel like both teams enter this game with uh, a gigantic question mark on one side of the ball, right? With Ole Miss, it's defense. With Tech, it's offense. I feel like the, the floor for this Tech offense is probably above the floor for that Ole Miss defense. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think Tech squeaks out a win here. I don't know what it looks like. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't be, you know, surprised at all if it goes the other way. Uh, but I, I feel like Tech uh, leaves Houston with a, a bit of a W. More from uh, Aaron at RedRaiderSports.com. Be safe. Uh, headed to Houston. We'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks, fellas. Always a pleasure. You too. Thanks to Aaron for joining us on the Billy's Pecans Hotline to talk Texas Tech and Ole Miss. The podcast also brought to you by Locker Stockers. They handle purchase and delivery to your locker or suite before game day. That'll be the case for Vault Hemingway, the Pavilion, or Swayze Field. And they'd like to incentivize you a little bit by getting a preseason price ready for you. So give them a call now. Only a couple days left to take care of the preseason price. 662 662- 586-1487, info at LockerStockers.com to take the major hassle out of stock you can go locker this football season. The uh, podcast is also brought to you by Billy's Pecans. Uh, yes, join us on the Billy's Pecans hotline. You can uh, go to Billy'sPecans.com, do some shopping. Uh, the pecans are fantastic. The cinnamon spice pecans, toasted pecans, all of the different chocolate pecans, milk chocolate, dark chocolate, white chocolate, chocolate amaretto, chocolate Grand Marnier which I haven't tried yet, but I should. I need to. My waistline won't like me, but my taste buds will. Uh, Southern pecan toffee, cheese crispies, pecan brittle, uh, pecan coffee cake, blueberry pecan coffee cake. It's all there at Billy's Pecans. Check them out at billyspecans.com or 1-800-624-7404. The uh, podcast also brought to you by Oxford University Bank. OUB is locally owned and operated right here in Oxford. When you deposit money at OUB, that money and the vast majority of the bank's profits go right back into the Oxford community. OUB gives you the comfort of home, all the benefits the big mega banks provide, all the technology and products you can want, all with a personal touch. When you call OUB, you speak directly with a live person, all without having to press 10 buttons, without a five-minute wait. OUB offering one-year CDs at 1.75% APY, three-year triple option CDs paying 2.01% APY. With the three-year term, customers can deposit once during the term, withdraw once during the term, and or bump the rate if OUB's three-year rate rises. To learn more about OUB, check out liveoxfordbankoxford.com or call 662-234. 6668 OUB is FDIC insured. Podcast also brought to you by Stacy Berry, the name to know in Memphis Realty. Color Williams, the number one real estate agency in the world and number one in agents, units sold, and volume sold. And the Berry Home Team is now an integral part of that brand. If you're a first time home buyer or looking to downsize, Stacy will evaluate and determine your current home value and sell it quickly for top dollars. If you're looking to sell a home, buy a home, or invest in real estate, the Berry Home Team is the place to unlock Memphis for you. 901 481 Six four two zero Stacy Lane Berry at KW dot com. That's L A I N E and Stacy with an E. Stacy Lane Berry at KW dot com and the Berry Home Team, the name to know in Memphis. So um thanks to Aaron. Hard to uh, argue with any of that. As we said earlier in the show, I have no idea. I, I I frankly don't have much of a feel for this. I am uh from a from a picking standpoint, worried about Ole Miss defensively, Texas Tech. Doesn't have a whole lot of quarterback compared to past seasons, even though Kingsbury seems to get a lot out of them and develop them as time goes on. As uh, as Aaron said, I was not aware of that. Texas Tech typically loses games. It's already trailing at halftime. They don't have a lot of comeback ability during his uh, his tenure as well. So, I mean, it. the more and more I think about it and you go, hey, this is close because of this, this, or that, a couple stops and this thing can get squirrely for either team in a bad way fast. Yeah, because I don't really know what to expect from Jordan Tamu. I think he's going to be a really good quarterback. I think so. Am I? 
Am I willing to bet on it? I was like, one of the questions on the message board yesterday was buy or sell Jordan Tamu better than Shea Patterson. I was asked that question. I was out walking the dogs. I was As in Patterson this year, Tamu this year. I guess so. Like right now, who's a better quarterback right now? I got to be honest. I mean, it, it sounds like a cop-out answer. Can I watch Saturday's games? Because Michigan plays Notre Dame, don't yeah. they? Yeah. I mean, I want to see Shea Patterson against Notre Dame. What time is that game? I don't have any idea. I mean, I want to see it. I mean, neither one – my, my – I finalized because I kept. Someone said, "Are you not going to answer?" And so I was like, "Okay, well, my answer, I guess, is sell. I guess I'd go with Patterson over Tamu today, based on just arm talent." Patterson is not going to have the weapons around him at Michigan. Um, if if Patterson has an issue that I don't know is real easy, easily correctable. He lacks poise in the pocket so much that what does that look like now? Michigan's going to run in much more of a pro-style set. That they're not going to change their offense for him necessarily. Right. How Michigan's does he handle that on, type of drop? Michigan's better on defense. Oh, yeah, no doubt. So perhaps Patterson will feel like, hey, I don't have to carry. Because I do think in defense of Shea, and again, I don't have a problem with Shea. I think his dad's a psychopath, but I don't have a problem with him. Um, in defense of Shea, I do think he thought, I've got to carry this team. I, I, we can't have three and out. I, I got to make a play happen. Got to make it happen. He's, if you remember, his first game was A&M, and he won that game. And the defense fed off him. Yeah. But he won that game. Jeffrey would get on you about Mike President. It would. I couldn't help um, it. He won that game. And then a week later, where he played okay, the defense was deplorable, and they got whipped. And then against Mississippi State, I thought Shea played pretty well that day, and the defense was just got awful. And so you can see how the mindset got set in Shea Patterson. Hey, man, you got to carry this. You can't just be good. you got to be awesome. I get it. I'm curious to see what he looks like after having some calm. I would guess that things are a little less. I would think things inside the building are probably a little more controlled at Michigan than they were at Ole Miss last year. Not Matt Luke's fault, but the deal with Hugh Freeze and all that was crazy. And I think Shea immediately started thinking, what am I going to do? Did I make a mistake? Should I get out of here? He had his brother there. He was the reason his brother had a job. And that's pressure right there. Hey, do really well so that your brother can stay in coaching. Because otherwise he can't get a coaching gig. Um, Do real well because we've moved the family everywhere because of you. The entire family re revolves around you. That's pressure on a 19-year-old kid. And then, okay, now the program's going to go on probation. It's going to get a two-year bull ban. Um. Are you staying? Are you going? All of those things. And this is a family that basically has said, hey, you're going to go to the NFL and make millions, and we're going to ride off your coattails forever because that's healthy. So now he's at Michigan, and I would assume that Harbaugh has more control over some of that, that it's a little more stable, although the expectations inside Michigan are that he wins the Heisman Trophy. So it's – it's. I actually catch myself feeling sorry for the kid and giggling at the family. 6.30 start for Michigan and Notre Dame. Uh, Notre Dame favored by one point right now. Also, uh, just got a a, uh, a message from him. Aaron has the exact number. Cliff Kingsbury, Texas Tech, when trailing in half, 2-27. and 27. Well, that's not good. It's not a great record. It's not a, it's not a good mark. Not a good mark. So, 2-27 and 27 there with uh, – you know, the people that have always been really mad at how Hugh Freeze's team's – did at halftime on uh on on getting better that would that, that's a much worse mark than that even cliff would not uh would not get approval from from that sect i've said it numerous times here the mark that really shocked me last year although when you look back at it you're like oh i see it cumulatively Ole miss won the first quarter and won the third quarter fairly handedly last season got popped in the second and the fourth that's a depth thing Oh, yeah, no That's doubt. That's not adjustments and such. That's depth. 
something to watch. So there's two things to watch. If you're a listener to this fine podcast and basing on the numbers, many of you are. Um, if you're looking for a couple of things, look for halftime score and watch the second and fourth quarters to see whether Ole Miss looks like it's conditioned. Well, not even conditioned, just body's depth. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can be conditioned like hell, but if you're out there too much, it shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chad Kelly, that last start is tonight. Again, I wrote about it a little bit this morning, but he's going to get a final opportunity. And as I wrote, it, 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 this, this isn't about QB1. Case Keenum's the quarterback in Denver. But i tell you what it is about. It's about making sure he has a comfortable roster spot because if he looks good again, they can't afford to cut him. They have to keep him on this roster They're because he him. because he will not clear waivers at the this point. The one guy that they could have traded for, they decided not to trade for because your boys in New Orleans traded for him. Bless him. Um, Teddy Bridgewater would have made some sense. He's, he got experience. If if you're Denver, and yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. believe in. Okay, here's Lynch, my question you for don't you. Believe in Chad Kelly, a guy like Bridgewater would have made sense. Here's my question for you. Wrote about this a little bit too. Paxton Lynch is owed on the cap about four and a half million dollars the next two years. Yep. If you cut him, you lose four and a half million bucks on your cap. Yep. Do you keep three quarterbacks just to save that four and a half million, or do you need that roster spot somewhere else? For right now, I keep them. You keep can, Lynch and Kelly, and unless I can trade Lynch for like a fourth or fifth round pick, and I don't think I can right now, I probably just hang on to him right now. Because one of the one of the Denver writers made that point. In some ways, Kelly is saving Lynch's job potentially. Yes. Potentially. Yes. Because had Kelly sucked, they would just brought in a backup and cut everybody. If that's my point. If yeah. Kelly sucks, or Kelly is not good enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To go hey, okay. Because here's the deal: you got if you're if you're inside that building, you've got to say, all right, yes, Case Keenum's QB one. Yeah, of course, no doubt. We're not playing him this week. Getting his ankle rolled, wrapping him in bubble wrap. Yes, yeah, standard stuff. Nothing standard whatsoever. Stuff. Now, if you're Denver and you don't believe that Chad Kelly's ready, maybe it, maybe if you're Denver and you're like, God, I kind of like this kid, but man, I don't know. Hadn't played in a while, and I don't. Uh, you go out and you make a deal. You have to eat that. You have to eat that risk. You have to say, hey. He's got trade value because Kelly has some trade value right now. There's probably a list of teams that would trade a fifth-round pick right now for Chad Kelly. Fair? I always overemphasize what people will trade because the trade market's so weird compared to what my head tells me. But, yes, he would definitely have some standing out there. There's no doubt. You could move him. Yeah, you can move him for something. He doesn't really hold a cap hit for anybody. No, no, no. So, you know. Anyway, they clearly don't believe that. They think he's ready. They've made the decision that if, God forbid, in their world, Case Keenum breaks his leg in week two, that Chad Kelly could play a little bit. Now, they'd have to go get somebody, et cetera, et cetera. But they just let Teddy Bridgewater get off the market. They believe that he can play, and they think they're decent. I've read a lot of their stuff. They think they're okay. Feels like Bridgewater is just an insurance policy. I don't think they're doing a quarterback of the future thing. I think they're just doing an insurance policy. I, I think he's insurance. They've got a window that's very much open, so let's bring in some dude that if Drew gets hurt, it's not all hell breaking loose. Bring in a guy where if Breeze got hurt for two weeks, it'd be all right. he could go operate a little. Yeah. Hell, they like Taysom Hill or whatever his name is. But, yeah, I do too on special teams. Yeah. Keep him away from my quarterback room, but. I mean, he's a cute story and all, but let's yeah. not let, let's not operate some offense well, over that's here. Point. And so, so Denver's in the same boat going into this. They they clearly believe Paxton Lynch is a disaster. Well, he is a disaster. And you've got Case Keenum, who they in are. preseason games against reserves, he is completing less than fifty percent of his passes for one hundred and two yards on a pick. Right. That's my point. So they have Chad Kelly's won a job. Chad Kelly is a legitimate number two quarterback in the NFL right now, and they're probably starting to look at him and think, you know. Maybe. Maybe. Don't hate it. He's been good. 60-something percent, over no, 300 he's been yards. He's really good. Yeah. He's been really good. And you talked about this, and I've talked about this. Chad has grown up. <laughs> Imagine that. 
A person matures in his 20s. Freak of nature. Save the high school football thing. Oh, he yeah, did so nothing so at Ole Miss whatsoever. No, and and he's also started to surround himself with some really good people in his life. He's making smart decisions. He talked about in Denver. He's found. I mean, Chad was the guy that discovered salads, and he was like, "Oh, hey, this is cool." He's eating smart. If you look at him, out he looks better. Yeah, Chad probably played at Ole Miss a little overweight. Uh huh. You know. I mean, I'm one to talk, but I wasn't the quarterback. Yeah. He looks different now a little bit. He's leaned up, looks stronger. And he always has had a big-time arm. I think he talks more maturely now. His media skills have improved dramatically in about two years, which probably tells you that his skills inside the meeting room are, be- are better. And they've got a seventh-round pick invested in him, dude. That's it. The last dude. Dude that typically gets cut. Seventh round pick. You're John Elway and company. You're like, we might have been. And he, in many ways, for them, balances out the disaster of Lynch. Because they're like, we traded, That's a good point. Traded up for Lynch. We wasted a first round pick and the cap hit. But we might have found our quarterback at the end of the seventh round. Evens out. Yeah. And Case Keenum for them is a – and if you're Chad Kelly, Case Keenum's the perfect guy to be the backup to because Case Keenum is a guy who knows how to manage an NFL offense. He can put up numbers, but he's not like backing up Drew Brees yeah. in his early 30s where you're like, man, I'm never going to play. Yeah, It's not like backing up Aaron Rodgers where you're like, okay, unless he dies. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's there's a chance that there's a chance that Denver, if let's say Denver's, you know, four and eight after twelve games, there's a chance Denver goes up to Case Keenum and goes, Hey, look, you got your money. This isn't working out. This isn't working out. We gotta find out what what we got in this kid. Because the draft's coming up and we've got to figure out do we need to work our way up to try to make a run at a Drew Locke or someone like that, or or what, what do we have? That's where Chad Kelly might get a chance. And if Chad's smart, and I think he is right now, he is sponging Case Keenum. Mm -hmm. Last little note here. Many of you have had fancy football drafts over the last week or so. Um, Economic impact. This is from USA Today. Just saw this. Fantasy football in North America, f- economic impact, $7.2 billion last year. Uh, 59.3 million fantasy football players last year. 59.3 million. I'm not surprised. We talk about this all the time. 71% men, a little lower than you would anticipate potentially. But a lot of wives and girlfriends want to be involved. They yeah, let sure. them play. Sure. If it's not an overly serious league, put the girls play. Um. <laughs> Wow. No, but you know what I mean. <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> Expound. Okay, I will. <laughs> I'm kidding. Most of these leagues started when guys are in college, whenever that was, and they've maintained. And as they get older, the $15 buy-in is no longer real interesting to them, so they raise the prices and whatever. And frankly, it's a fraternity where they don't really want to include more people. So they try to keep the same group together, and it's mostly males from college. However, I mean, we had a league a couple of years ago where we had guys versus girls, and it was six of each, and that's the time the girls win, and you move on with your day, and it's, it's all right. But, you know, anyway, I'm done. That's it. I did not come out like I wanted it to come out. I apologize. I really pissed off our 4% or 6% <laughs> or whatever it is that we have there. For those of you out there, let the record show that I stood up for you. Yeah. Hi, Rebecca and Summer and a couple of you that we have. We appreciate you. Um, anyway. Um, this podcast has been brought to you by 7 South Tailgating. They're celebrating 10 years of business this season. Try them once. You'll never tailgate without them again. Uh, they'll set up their own your, your personal gear. You can rent everything from them. No one matches their customer service, their attention to detail at 7southtailgating.com. And one of our four percenters is Megan Phillips with LAH Real Estate. She's the person to call for all your real estate needs in the Birmingham area. 
With almost a decade of experience, Megan's knowledge and expertise can help you buy or sell your home today. So visit our website, MeganMPhillips.com. That's M-E-A-G-A-N-M Phillips.com. Or call Megan at 205-602-7929. Again, 205-602-7929. The uh, the preseason, the season came out yesterday. I watched a few minutes of it uh, this morning while I was getting a few other things done. But if anybody missed that and is interested, in it, it is uh, it is now out. How on, was it? Uh, it's fine. I mean, I you know when you're around it a lot, you kind of know everything going on. But otherwise, it was a uh, it was fine. It was well done. They had some recaps of last year. They had some fall camp stuff. Showed uh, you know we've written about this multiple times. It did show the uh, the fieriness of uh, John Summerall during practice. I thought that was probably one of the most new things that people could get a get a get a picture of he's very intense he is he's quite intense so podcast tonight from bunkies on the oxford square come hang out with us if that is not possible we will have it to you in recorded form tomorrow morning for friday's oxford exxon podcast plenty of podcasts this week on the mpw digital network and we will uh talk to you again soon